All right. Uh, example 16 of 753. Um, this is one of those problems that's, uh, that's really long. Um, Griffith skips a whole bunch in the hopes that you'll actually look into it and figure it out for yourself, which I encourage you to do. Um, I'm going to try to walk you through as much detail as possible. Um, at least in my mind, I've connected all the dots. There's nothing left. Um, you're going to need to remember some of your trigonometry identities, uh, particularly sine squared plus cosine squared is equal to 1. And um, we're going to have to work uh, simultaneously in spherical and um, Cartesian coordinates, so I have to be sure which basis we're working in. Um, this Maxwell stress tensor we have is Cartesian based. We can't, we don't have the spherical version of it, and I don't know that it would make life easier if we did. Okay, so the problem is we have a sphere, radius r. Um, let me just draw a picture of it up here. Um, we're going to slice it in half and figure out what the force, the total force is on the top part there. And so we're going to use the formula, the total force is equal to the integral along the surface of the Maxwell stress tensor dot dA vector minus epsilon naught mu naught the volume integral of the derivative of the S vector d tau. Okay, so this is a static um, sphere, uniform charge, no currents, no magnetic fields, so the S vector E cross B is going to be zero, and even if it wasn't, it doesn't matter, there's no time dependence on it. So everything's over on this side is zero, so we can cross this off and ignore everything here. Okay, we also know that the B vectors are going to be zero. There's no currents, there's no changing electric fields, so we're not going to get a B vector anywhere. So that significantly simplifies our Maxwell stress tensor uh, by half. Okay. Um, so let's divide and conquer. There's two ways we can approach this problem. I'm going to color in three different areas. One is the, the slice through the middle there, that circle. Another is the, the shell on top, because we're having to do a surface integral of a complete surface. And the last is basically we can do everything else outside and go out and create this infinite plane and then loop it back together um, where the electric field is effectively zero. And so we can calculate um, either one and two or we can calculate two and this green field three. And he does all three. And he shows that together you get a particular result that gives you the force and they are in agreement and everybody's happy. So let's start with the spherical shell like he does. So let's remind ourselves that um, the dA vector is equal to r squared sine theta d theta d phi in the r hat direction in spherical coordinates. That'll be useful. Let's remind ourselves that the electric field outside um, using Gauss's law really quick here, so the total charge enclosed is going to be the total charge. We have our 1 over epsilon naught here. The surface area is the surface area of a sphere, so that's 4 pi r squared, so we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q over r squared in the r hat direction. Okay, And the electric field on the inside is similarly easy to calculate. See, so you take the um, charge density, which is q divided by 4 thirds pi r cubed, multiply it by the some volume of the charge enclosed, so you get R cubed, R cubed over big R cubed is the charge enclosed at radius R, and then you divide by the surface area of the Gaussian surface, so you have 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, and then that's R squared, and the direction it's going to point is also in the R hat direction, and using some cancellation That's what it looks like. Okay, so we have our electric fields, we have our dA vector, um, we have R hat popping up everywhere, making our life miserable. Um, but R hat is actually um, not terribly complicated, and it's so we're going to have um, sine theta, cos phi, in the I hat direction sine theta sine phi in the j hat direction, this is plus, plus cos theta in the k hat direction. Okay, theta 
Oh, uh, that's theta, not phi. Theta. Ooh, that would be bad. Theta is the angle from the top. So at theta equals pi over 2, you're in the plane. And then theta equals pi, you're pointing straight down. Okay. Uh, phi is a direction you're pointing along the pane, plane. It starts out phi equals 0 is pointing in the x direction. Phi equals pi over 2 is in the positive y direction. And it goes back around. Okay. So that is your r hat. So we can plug these up here to change these two Cartesian coordinates as needed. Um, let's look at what happens when we do the t.da. So, t.da. is going to be something in the i direction there. Okay, So that's just the sum of the components. We're going to get an x component, we're going to get a y component, we're going to get a z component, which is not surprising. However, by symmetry, um, it's safe to assume that the x and y components are going to cancel out and only the z component is going to matter. Okay, So this is going to be equal to tzx dax plus t z y d a y plus t z z d a z uh, no matter what surface we're integrating across that's what we're going to get okay and um, the next thing is we use these to plug into the spherical top so let's start with the this is the top the half shell okay so top so theta goes from over 2 and phi as 0 to 2 pi and then r equals r okay um, tzx dax I think I've jumped the gun here I probably should have calculated what tzx no it depends on which electric field we're using okay so for this case we're using the electric field on the outside um, r is capital R squared of course uh, R squared will be capital R squared. So we do TZX. So TZX would be um, epsilon naught uh, EZ EX. So EZ would be this cosine theta, and then EX would be this sine theta cosine phi. So I'm just going to take um, the magnitude of E squared times cos theta sine theta cos phi. There's our tzx. Okay. Dax. Well, da in the x direction is this times that. So we get, oh gosh, should I, do you want to do that? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. 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 I'll do that. So we get um, times r squared sine theta d theta d phi in the r hat direction so that's uh, uh, we're doing the x component so sine theta cosine phi okay that's one of them the next one is also going to have an e squared okay tzy so now we take the z that component and the y component so that's component and sine phi sine phi oh I'm gonna kill myself um, and that's the day component so that's r squared and then we have uh, sine theta d theta d phi and then these two guys sine theta sine phi. And now we have the diagonal term which is slightly different than the other two. It's one half and then it's uh, ez squared minus ex squared minus ey squared. So that z squared is cosine squared theta minus this squared minus that squared. Let me write that out. Up sine squared phi times d a z so it's all this 
uh, d theta, uh, d phi, and then cosine theta. Okay, all right, let's look at this really quick. So these two terms, we can factor out of sine squared theta, then we're left with cosine squared phi plus sine squared phi, that's one, so we just have sine squared theta here. And we have cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta times all of this garbage, okay? Um, these guys, we can start collecting terms and we should be able to show, uh, well, we can factor out some things here. Okay, first of all, we can factor out uh, epsilon naught. We could factor out e squared, the magnitude of e squared. Well, that's d squared, right? And then we can factor out r squared sine theta d theta d phi. That all of them have those terms. Okay. And then we're left with this. So the interesting part is we have over here cosine theta, sine theta, cosine phi, and then we have sine theta, cosine phi again. So we have sine squared theta, cosine squared phi. And again here, sine squared theta, sine squared phi. Okay. We do the same trick we did here. So we have cosine squared theta times sine squared theta times cosine squared phi and another term with sine squared phi. So we get cosine sine squared theta. And then now we have one half of this dude. So we have one half cosine squared theta. And then this is a um, we pulled out the sine theta, so we have another cosine squared. We have another cosine um, minus one half sine squared theta, cosine theta. Okay, this looks like a, a royal mess, um, but we should be able to reduce this all down to a single um, a cosine over two, according to what the book has, and hopefully it shouldn't be too hard to see what to do. Um, why am I drawing a blank on how I simply, I did this in my head, it was so beautiful and easy. I'm going to take a pause here while I try to remember what I did. Thanks. Okay, I'm back. I figured out what I did wrong. This cosine squared theta term magically appeared, threw me off. It's supposed to be cosine theta. Yes, that's correct. So let's get rid of that squared term. Everything gets magically easier. So, no, it's not squared, it's single. So let's bring out the factor of, of uh, E naught, E squared, R squared, sine theta, and the cosine theta term, D theta, D phi, times, we have sine squared theta, we have one half cosine squared theta, minus one half sine squared theta, sine squared theta minus one half sine theta squared theta, is one half cosine squared theta plus one half sine squared theta, so that's just one half. So we bring out the factor of two, and that all becomes one. Okay, so this is the um, t dot d a stuff. Okay, so now we have this complicated integral to solve. Next page. So our force on the top is equal to the integral, surface integral t dot dA. So that's going to be, let's pull out all the constants here. So we have epsilon naught over two, e squared, r squared, okay? And then the integral of sine, say the cosine theta, d theta, d phi, and that is um, where it's a double integral, so we're going to go from theta equals zero to, to half pole, pi over two, and phi equals zero to two pi. Well, there's no phi terms inside here, so that's just a two pi that we get to bring out pi, and then now we have this integral, 
Okay. So what is that integral? That integral is actually rather easy to solve um, if you remember that That's just sine theta, two sine theta. The derivative of sine theta is cosine theta. Okay, so that integral pi, and then we're going to evaluate um, one half sine squared theta between zero and pi over two. Um, sine squared of zero is zero, sine squared of pi over two is one, and so it's just one half of all that. So this is equal to one half epsilon naught e squared r squared pi. So let's try to get everything looking like a normal um, force. So we're gonna have a uh, charge squared on the top, we're gonna have um, something over one over four pi epsilon naught and everything. So e, if we go back to our e equation, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over capital R squared. So let's do that. Uh, Q squared over 16 pi squared epsilon naught squared. And uh, we had, we're going to have four R's on the bottom. And then we have two R's on the top. We have another pi. Okay, so we have. Um, Let's draw 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught q squared over r squared, something r squared. So we have 1 pi left over. That's the pi there. We had to borrow a 2, so we have 8. OK, so the force on the top is equal to this. OK, that wasn't so bad, was it? Next. Section I'll solve for the disk in the middle. Thanks for your time. Bye.